Well, good morning. We are here to worship Christ the risen today. Worship Christ the risen King, for Christ the Lord has risen today. And so I would ask, just ask you to join us as we sing those two songs. Worship Christ the risen King, and Christ the Lord has risen today. And lift your voices, Christ has conquered death and hell. Sing as all the earth rejoices, resurrection anthem swell. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. tomb where death had laid him empty now its mouth declares death and I could not contain him for the throne of life he shared come and worship come and worship worship Christ the risen King the earth protest and tremble see the stone removed with power all hell's minions may assemble but cannot withstand his hour he has conquered he has conquered Christ the Lord the risen King your life O oh Jesus now we sing your victory sin and hell may seek to seize us but your conquest keeps us free stand in triumph stand in triumph worship Christ the risen King Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Ye heavens and earth. Again, our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting, Alleluia. Dying once, he all does say, Alleluia. Bear thy victory.
Christ has led. Alleluia. Following our exalted head. Alleluia. Made like him, like him we rise. Alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. What a powerful song. Ours, the cross, the grave, and the skies. Soaring with him. I pray that today and every day that you are soaring with Christ above all of life's problems and frustrations. And Easter Sunday is an awesome time to remember the resurrection of Christ and to know where we are headed So praise the Lord for that. I want to encourage you, my one announcement today is I want to encourage you to get a picture of your family, get an Easter picture. I know it won't be here at the church, but maybe outside at home. I know the weather's going to be a little iffy on Sunday, some thunderstorms, so who knows? It could be great weather for photography outside. Or um, just take it inside. Maybe you're going to be all in your pajamas. I've heard people joke about getting pajam- Easter pajamas instead of an Easter outfit. Uh, that would be awesome. Or if you are going to do the Easter outfits and do it just like you normally do, then that's awesome as well. But get a picture of your family and post it on Facebook, the internet. Get it out there on social media and proclaim that Christ is risen. I also want to encourage you to Take that, that uh, video that we're going to have up of this service and post that with your picture. Because the church may be empty, the church building may be empty today, but God can use this opportunity, this Easter, to share, for the gospel to go forth through you sharing and through you proclaiming. And I think one way we can do that is to share this service and to share the gospel with people. So... That is my one announcement today, and he is risen, and he is risen indeed. I want to say that one time. Say that with me. Okay, repeat after me, because I I miss that here at church on Sunday. Usually I say that, and I get a repeat, he is risen indeed. So I'm going to say that, and you repeat it in your home. He is risen. Amen. is my beginning the line drawn in the sand the end of all my striving now I am born again there Jesus was forsaken So I will never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is finished Christ has won He is risen
He is worthy of all of our praise, and it's by faith that we can approach Jesus. So will you sing the song with us, By Faith? shall be moved, and the power of the gospel shall prevail, for we know in Christ all things are possible, for all who call upon His name. Till the race is finished 
cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forever. couple people asked me this just this past week if they can send in a check to the office and I wonder how many out there were probably wondering about that so I want to I want to make sure I I make that clear that you can send checks still to the office I am here throughout the week and am um, checking in the mailbox to make sure it doesn't fill up so if you want to send a check here you can do that in your in your offering um, and also of course you can give online through our website there, just click on that down, on, uh, up on the top, and it'll give you a scroll down. You can, you can click on the give option there. Uh, so let's worship the Lord this morning with our tithes and our offerings, and, and uh, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for uh, all of the provisions that you've given to us, Lord, even providing for us through this tough time. Lord, I can think of some who've had a harder time than others. I pray that you would provide for them, Lord, that you would give them your peace. And Lord, I thank you that we can 
trust you and we can continue to, to give and, and worship you through, out, out of all that you've given to us, Lord. It is all yours and we just want to give back to you. We want these tithes that we give to you to be used to further your kingdom. That the gospel would continue to go forth. And Lord, that there would be fruit. Lord, be with our missionaries overseas that we support. And I pray that you would, you would bless them and, and multiply their ministry. And Lord, help them to be encouraged this Easter season. I don't know what countries are shut down, what, what churches are going to be meeting, Lord, but you do. And I pray no matter what, that, Lord, that you would... Uh, Strengthen your church and build your church during this time and use your offerings that are going to be collected today to do that. In your name we pray, amen. as we sing Living Hope.
Church, you can turn with me to Hebrews, or sorry, not Hebrews, Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. That is going to be our focus uh, for this morning, but we're actually going to go through uh, most of Habakkuk. So actually, just turn to Habakkuk, and that may be a hard one to find. Uh, It is in between Nahum and Zephaniah. It's one of those minor prophets that often don't get addressed And um, so you might have a hard time finding it there, but it's between those two at the end of the Old Testament. Before we get started, I want to pray for, um, specifically, for Dean Roth and Velda Roth. Uh, I just got a call from Dean, two calls today, actually. She, Velda, has been taken now to DMH, and she has a respiratory infection, and they're doing tests. They don't know exactly what that is. They're pretty sure it's not COVID-19, but uh, she has, of course, been under really fighting for her health for quite a while now, and we need to lift them up in prayer. And the real burden of my heart is that he cannot be with her. And I want to just lift up them, but also anyone right now that has a loved one in the hospital that cannot go and see that person. That has got to be very, very tough. So let's lift them up in prayer. Father, I thank you that you know our pains. Lord, you know what it is to struggle in this world, in this broken world in which we live. And Lord, uh, I pray that uh, that your understanding heart would be near to Dean, to Velda. Lord, we do pray that you would heal her, bring her back to health. Lord, we do pray that you would strengthen her soul, give her strength in her mind and in her heart. And Lord, uh, strengthen Dean as well as he goes through this trial and minister to him. And Lord, be with all those out there right now that have a loved one in the hospital that cannot go and see that person. Lord, would you work in their hearts, draw them to yourself, 
We ask for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. In your name we pray, amen. So before we get into it this morning, I just want to say that this is a difficult Easter for a lot of us pastors because we are used to a packed house. We're used to church being full and it's exciting and we're preaching on the resurrection of Christ, the, most, the greatest event in all of history we get to preach on to a packed house. And it is an exciting time. And we are burdened by the fact that we are not able to see the church and be with the church. And I think the hardest thing for me is not hearing the church singing the praises, their, the, the church's praises to the King of Kings on Resurrection Sunday. And so that is probably one of the most, most difficult parts of it for me. It's, let's just say it how it is. It's not, it's not all a bed of roses right now. And, um, and that's really what Habakkuk is about. That is what the beginning of this sermon is about. It's about the devastations that were going on in Israel at that time. And looking at that for what it really was and not just ignoring it or, 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 or stuffing it down and not dealing with the problem. My heart is burdened for America in general. I mean, Easter Sunday is a time when I get to preach and there are some people that come that I may never see again for the rest of the year, but I know they're going to be here on Easter Sunday and I'm excited about the chance of them hearing a sermon and hearing the word of God and hearing the gospel. And I don't know where they're at with the Lord, but I'm excited that they're here. And so I'm saddened that I don't get to do that. And I hope that they're going to hear it online and, and, and hear the gospel online. But it's, it's also a time to think about where is our nation as far as spiritually Speaking, where are we? What's the state of our nation spiritually? I want to kind of give you a, an overview of how Christianity has, in a sense, declined in America just in the past 20 to 30 years. In 2019, 65% of American adults considered themselves Christians. 65%. And those are the ones that say they're a Christian, may not go to church, but just say, they're a Christian. In 2012, it was 78%. In 2001, it was 81.6%. And in 1990, it was 85%. So we have seen a decline lately, and that is a burden for me as well. It's something that when I look at the culture in America and I see the results of morality declining as well, going hand in hand with the decline of Christianity, it is extremely concerning for me. I want you to think right now, before we dig into this text, what is it that scares you? What is it that saddens you, that is a burden for your heart? Think about that for a little bit. What is it that is a burden in your heart? If you have a journal Bible, maybe write it down there in Habakkuk. Journal about that. For me, probably the, one of the most intense burdens for me right now is the fact that my parents are getting older and I'm more concerned about their health than I've ever been before. With this COVID-19 virus out, I'm thinking, I sure hope that they don't get this. My dad just called me last week, told me that, uh, my mom fell and tripped and fell and she, she thinks she broke her wrist and her wrist was really hurting her really badly and so she thought she broke it and my dad was going to run and get someone, I, I don't know if he was going to get his phone or what, he had to run somewhere and he told me, he said, he said, T, I, I couldn't run. He said, for the first time in my life, I wanted to run and it, I couldn't do it. So we go on walks all the time, but I can't remember the last time that I ran. So I'm, I'm just getting older. I'm just getting older. And I think about that and I go, 
The last time my mom was here visiting, she said, you know, you're going to be doing our funerals. I just, all these things go, to my, go into my mind, and I had this burden of thinking about someday saying, not goodbye, but see you later to them, and knowing that I won't have them with me for the rest of my time here on this earth. My parents lost their parents when they were about my age, and so I am more concerned about that, and that could be a weight that could spiral down into some sort of depression if I let it, if I let it get a grip on me. So I want you to think about those things, those dark things that scare you, that sometimes we push down and pretend that they're not there. And that is what is going on with Habakkuk. Habakkuk is this prophet during this time in Israel where, where sin was on the rise, justice was... Uh, evasive and they just as a people were declining and falling falling away from the Lord and because of that the wicked were were on the rise and and those who were righteous were being burdened by those who were wicked and and there there was no justice in the land and so Habakkuk is crying out to God about this and instead of stuffing it down or or remaining angry or bitter about the problem, he's taking it to God and he's telling God what he feels and the frustrations of his heart. The disciples were also burdened on Friday all the way up until today. They were burdened with the fact that they saw, some of them saw, some of them were hiding, some of them saw their savior, their king, their teacher being tortured and dying on the cross, and then put in the grave. And so, let us, let us go to Habakkuk this morning and see what God has to say to us about times when our hearts feel faint, times when we feel burdened by the problems around us, and we want to ignore that they're even there. Habakkuk, we're going to start in chapter 1. We're just going to read 1 through 4 here. It says this, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and Justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. And you can feel and hear the pain in the voice of Habakkuk as he shares his problems and his burdens with God and asks for an answer. One thing that I want to make crystal clear here is that scripture does not deny the reality of the broken world that we live in. It does not deny that. My dad said that he invited uh, some neighbors to go to church, and they were going for a while, and eventually they stopped going. And the, the, the husband was just kind of grumpy all the time. And, and my dad just couldn't figure it out. Why? Why they stopped going. And he asked him, and he told my dad, he said, you know, it just seems like they're just always happy all the time in that church. Like, it just seems so fake. Like, they're just happy all the time. And my dad and I are talking about this, and we're like, what, are they supposed to go around sad, looking sad all the time? I don't think that would go over too well. You know, as believers, we have every reason to be filled with joy. That's, that's been our series through Philippians, it's all about joy. Joy. And so how is it that believers shouldn't be filled with joy? Well, here's the facts. Sometimes people think, because us as believers, we tend to have this trite statement for everything, and we, we know that God has the answers, and so sometimes we tend to forget that there is a time to mourn and there's a time to talk about some of the frustrations of life. You know, on Facebook, a lot of times during these times, you see people putting up all these pictures of having this wonderful time as a family. And, 
and the facts are that it's not always as perfect as you put up on Facebook, right? There are a lot of struggles that parents are having with their kids at home. I guarantee you that. In fact, I would think that at the end of this time, parents would probably be saying, we need to give our teachers a raise because this has got to be a really trying time. I see Justin in the back and the sound saying amen to that. So this is a, this is, the, the facts are there. The problem is we sometimes ignore them as believers. We sometimes talk about only the good things and don't talk about some of the struggles as well. But God's word doesn't do that. God's word deals with the struggles. It talks openly. And that's why sometimes we have a hard time as Christians reading some of the Old Testament because it seems so dark. Well, what we don't realize in our American comfortable bubble that we live in is that Israel went through some very, very, very dark times. Times where people were starving. Times where they were being destroyed by their enemies. Times where sin was so rampant that their intentions of everyone's heart was just evil all the time. There wasn't a good legal system. Here in Habakkuk, there's just no justice even. He says, people are just getting away with murder all around me. God, why don't you see this? What are you doing? I could list many other passages in Scripture that speak to the same kind of issues. Ecclesiastes is a good one where he, he, he opens up his heart and just says, this is what's wrong. Like It's just vanity chasing after the wind. And he talks about how the rich have power and the... And, and the rich who have power are the wicked ones. And the ones who are poor are, are seemingly more righteous. And they don't have power. And he, he talks about that in Ecclesiastes. Lamentations is all about lamenting about the, the, the pains and the trials that Israel is going through. And of course here in Habakkuk and Jesus' life. I mean, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. And Jesus mourned with those who mourned. And Jesus reached out to those who were hurting and he wept with people. He wept with Lazarus' family, his sisters, and he cried with people. And do we do that? Maybe we need to be better at mourning with those who mourn and feeling the sting of the brokenness of this world sometimes. And maybe the reason why we don't do it is because our faith is not strong enough to be able to go into that and mourn with hope. You see, you don't want to mourn and you want to pretend like nothing's wrong when you don't know how to, how to mourn properly. And, and you're afraid to look at the depravity and the problems and the brokenness. You want to pretend that it's not there. That's me sometimes. I'm an optimistic person and sometimes I struggle when something isn't right to recognize it for what it is without being able to fix it. And we see this here in Scripture, and God helps us work through our pains and our struggles. You might be thinking by now, Pastor, this is Easter Sunday. We're supposed to be praising Jesus and celebrating. And my, my word to that is, yes, we are. But to really celebrate, you have to go through the reality of the broken world that we live in. When you recognize how broken it is and then you see that God uses and he's on his throne and he's going to, to save us from all this mess, then you can really rejoice. Then you can really rejoice. So, what is God's answer to Habakkuk? What is his answer? This is a dialogue between Yahweh, the Lord God, and Habakkuk. And so God says this in chapter 1. We're going to just read through sections of Habakkuk here. Chapter 1, verse 5. Look among the nations and see, wonder, and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. These are the Babylonians. That bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Then down to verse 10. 
At kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. Wow. So here God tells Habakkuk, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans, those dreaded Babylonians, and I'm going to bring them in and they're going to bring justice to my people. They're going to humble my people and my people will be brought into exile. And yet he says, these people are even worse. Notice he says, they sweep by like the wind and go on guilty men whose might is their own God. They're their own God. So you can just think how Habakkuk wanted to respond to that. He's probably just scratching his head. And, and God said he would scratch his head because he says here, you would not believe if I told you. I'm about to do something that you don't even, it's beyond what you can fully understand. You're going to have a hard time believing this. And so Habakkuk in verse 13 responds to God, you who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Habakkuk's like, why would you bring them in? They're worse off than us. Why would you do this? Why would you allow them to destroy us? And then down to chapter 2, verse 2. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. I love this. So he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. Star that in your Bible. Underline that. He contrasts the Babylonians with the righteous who shall live by faith. And then verse 9, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. Verse 12, woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Verse 19, woe to him who says to a wooden thing, awake to a silent stone, arise. And then verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. And then in chapter 3, we get to our main text where Habakkuk is praying and praising God after hearing about that. What God says here is that he is going to move for his glory and for the good of his children. I'm going to deal with all these people. Woe to these people. Justice is going to happen. Justice is going to take place. Don't worry. And as believers, when we look back at redemptive history of God bringing about the Messiah, God preserving his people, God promising that he's going to bless the entire world through Israel, God promising Abraham that he's going to have, I'll be a father of a great nation, even though at the time in that instance, his wife Sarah had no children and was old in age. We look back throughout all of this and we see, wow, God is in control. We look at situations and stories in the midst of that narrative, like Joseph and his brothers and how his brothers sell him into slavery and God uses Joseph being put in Egypt to save his own family from a famine. God is in control and he uses even the hard things, the evil things for his good and perfect will. You see, I think if you're, if you're like me, we don't have a problem. I don't have a problem when God is moving, when I can see him moving, when I see him doing things, I go, see, look, God is good. But when he isn't doing anything and I can't see it, I struggle. And that's what Habakkuk is saying here. God, why are you just idle? What's going on? It seems like you're not here. And then think of the 
400 years of silence between the prophets and when Jesus came. 400 years. God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Oh, he's working. We just may not see it. He's working, church. The resurrected Christ is in control of all things. He's powerful beyond what we can even imagine. And he is working. And that's what God is trying to help Habakkuk see. Habakkuk, I'm going to use even the evil people to bring justice to this situation. And don't you worry, Habakkuk. I'm going to deal with these people as well. Justice will be served and the righteous will be vindicated. And the righteous live by faith. Faith is powerful. Faith is what this sermon is really all about. Because sandwiched in the middle of Habakkuk, with, between Habakkuk's depression and Habakkuk's brokenness, and then Habakkuk seeing the light and rejoicing in God as Savior and knowing that he's going to tread on his high places, God tells him, the righteous shall live by faith. So we get to Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. I love this. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice In the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Now remember, this beautiful text comes right after God says, The Lord is in his holy temple. Be silent and just wait. I may not look like I'm doing anything. Oh, but I am. My ways are not your ways. In fact, a thousand years is like one day to me. So know that I'm in my holy temple. I'm sitting on my throne, Habakkuk. I'm going to work for the good of those who are my people. And I'm going to live up to my promises. I always have and I always will, Habakkuk. Trust me. And that is what gives Habakkuk the strength that he needed to press on and give us this beautiful text passed down through thousands of years for us to hold fast and to have faith today in whatever it is that you're going through. Whatever it is, that fear that you have that scares you to death, may you tread on that fear. May you speak God's word and his strength and rejoice in the Lord of your salvation, and you will run like the deer. Run like the deer over those high places in your life. What is your high place? What is the stronghold that the enemy has on you? Could be a lie he has you believing. Could be a sin that makes you feel like you're worthless and that God would not forgive you. I urge you, that if that's the case, go back. If you have Facebook, we're actually going to get it on our church website here too, the Good Friday devotional that I did. And I want you, if sin is something that you feel like is just keeping you separate from God, you don't feel worthy, that I pray that you would go to that devotional and you would Let God minister to your soul. As Jesus said to his disciples, oh, how I long, I've been waiting and anticipating having this meal with you so that I could take those burdens off your back. And so, whatever your high place is, you speak the word of God and the truth of God to that high place. And in faith, you have power to overcome it. That is the power of faith. Faith in a powerful God gives power to frailty. Let 
me say it one more time. Faith in a powerful God gives power to frailty. And we all are frail. Jesus' disciples were frail. I, I can imagine that when, when they were when they were hiding and they were, some of them watching, John right there with Jesus' mother and he's watching Jesus suffering on this cross, that they felt more frail than they've ever felt in their entire life. But listen to this, church. The most evil event in all of history was Jesus' death on the cross. That was the most evil event in all of history because it was a perfect God, creator of the entire world, come down to serve humanity and to love us. And what did we do? We put him on a cross and tortured him as a public spectacle for people to spit on and laugh at. That was the most evil event in all of history. Some people have tried to say, oh, the God of the Old Testament is, is wrathful and the God of the New Testament is grace and mercy. Baloney. God is full of grace and mercy in the Old Testament and slow to anger, abounding in love, and yet he's also a God of justice because of back saying, come on, God, bring your justice. Isn't it interesting that we think of the Old Testament as being, some people I mean, think today, the Old Testament is a, is a book of wrath, and yet we have people in the Old Testament begging for God's wrath. And the New Testament, yes, he's full of grace and mercy and love, but he's also full of wrath towards sin, and it was poured out on Christ on that cross for your sin and for my sin. And yet, that evil event in history God used for the greatest good to save your soul and mine if you accept him as your savior. God can use anything and he is in control. I wonder what the enemy thought when Jesus was being crucified because Satan can't see the end. Only God sees that. You see, God sees the moves that Satan's gonna make before he even moves them. Before he even does them, he knows what he's going to do. And God orchestrates all of it to bring everything under his control and his good and perfect will. And I'm telling you, when I started to grasp, and I'm still grasping this, the sovereignty of God to bring all things under his control, that's when the peace of God started guarding my heart towards the fears that robbed me of joy and peace. His peace became my peace as my faith was strengthened and I had a more appropriate and factual perspective of who God is. That he will bring all things under his control. We've been going through Philippians and I'd like to turn to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4 This is right where we're at. And I think this is just so perfect and appropriate for Easter Sunday. Philippians 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Now this is Paul speaking, but this is God speaking through Paul, breathing out his words through Paul. Paul is telling the church, therefore, Church, my brothers, whom I love and I long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. No matter what comes your way, you stand firm on the resurrected Christ. Therefore, takes you back to the verses before chapter four and verse in chapter three. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. He will subject all things to himself, this Jesus. He is in complete control. And so when I fear and think about my dad getting grayer and getting older and not able to run like he used to, that I can remember that this Jesus that I worship 
every week, oh man, he's going to bring it all under his control. And he is going to give my father and me and all of us that our bodies are wearing out this new glorified body just like Jesus. And so I stand firm in my faith in the risen Christ. Church, do you stand firm in the risen Christ? Do you stand firm? I pray that your faith will be strengthened this morning. If, if a man has prophets before him, thousands of years, hundreds of years before him, talk about his birth, that he's going to be born of a virgin, that he was going to be born to a specific family, the tribe of Judah, of David, that he was going to be rejected by men, that he was going to be born in a humble situation, circumstances, and that he was going to die, and that he was going to remain silent before his accusers, if that was all prophesied about a man before he was even born, and then that man lives out that exactly in his life, things that he can't even control from a human perspective, and then his own brother follows him because his own brother says that he's the Messiah, the Savior, and believes that he was perfect and didn't even make one mistake his entire life. And then that man actually says that he is going to die at the hands of the Gentiles and that he is going to then raise from the grave on the third day. And then he does that. And then all of the eyewitnesses, 500 plus eyewitnesses, see this risen man and then are willing to die for him. Church, I trust that man. And I pray that you trust that man and that man is Jesus Christ. Who do you say that he is today? And if you say that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, risen from the grave, dying on the cross for your sin, then you can stand on this rock and nothing can steal your joy and your peace. Yes, life is gonna be hard. Yes, you're gonna weep with those who weep. Yes, you're gonna see troubles and trials, but you're going to rejoice because you have a God that is bigger than all of those trials and will use all of those trials for your good and for his glory in the end. This is his world. We're gonna end with singing this song. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Let us pray. Father, oh, how we are so prone to forget, to pick back up some of the little idols that we put before you, to start to fear things again. Oh, Lord, remind us afresh and anew this morning that you are the King of kings, the Savior of the world, the risen Christ and you are on your throne and you are making all things new and you will bring us to yourself. In your name, amen. Now will you sing with us that song that TJ just read from, This Is My Father's World. This is
Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, when ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given a name. morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began know your grace so free washes over me you have made me new now life begins with you released from my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he cancelled my death and he called me his friend Death was arrested and my life began. You know your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. On a criminal's cross the Darkness rejoiced As though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose With our freedom in hand And that's when death was arrested And my life began that's when death was arrested and my life began. For oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you.
may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.